Hi guys, welcome back. I'm your host, Veda. And I'm your art historian, Evelyn. And this is a new episode of Frame. I am a New York-based performing artist and designer. And I'm a scholar and specialist in Italian Renaissance and Baroque art. If you're new here, so are we, more or less. We just started this new adventure. If you like what we do, please subscribe to our channel. And if you like this episode, please feel free to hit the like button. Mm -hmm. If you like my makeup, you're welcome. If you don't like it, I forgot my brushes at home today and I did everything with my fingers. And no, Evelyn um, had one brush, so Sorry guys. never panic. I'm not, we are complimentary too, like <laughs> David and Judith, you know? Actually, before bragging, I should, because sometimes yeah. everything looks perfect there. And then I put it on my computer and it's huge and I'm like, so Judith and, and David are often represented together and that happened also in the Medici Palace so because this Judith that we're going to analyze shortly by Donatello was actually sculpted for the Medici family as well. And we know from a 15th century document that between 1466 and 69, Judith was located at the center of the garden of the Palace of the Medici and as we discussed before, the David was at the center of the courtyard. So they were communicating with one another in a sense. And they were, uh, by the way, the two um, earliest freestanding sculptures in the most public spaces within the palace. So a lot of, um, a lot of view, uh, public eyes, let's say, were laid on both sculptures and people knew that the two of them were supposed to be a pair. But there's something deeper and more interesting about the comparison, I think, between Judith and David. There's a, a lot of things. If you read the stories of the two uh, figures from the Bible, they are very similar. They're both unexpected heroes. He is a young man, inexperienced, and she is a widow, so like a, a, a lonely woman, and they were able to overcome a great enemy and to free their people. Then they bear no arms. None of them are using any weapon except from their faith in God. And actually, in the end, both of them ended up beheading the monster they're fighting against with the sword of the enemy. So both of them are um, represented in words in the Bible as coming back to their town in triumph, holding the head of the beheaded general and the sword as a sign of power and conquer. And also the other parallel, I think it's very important that will come up again and again throughout this uh, second episode, is that they're both very beautiful. And their beauty is a symbol of God's favor. So as you can see, there's a lot of uh, parallels between the two figures. Let's look at the story of Judith uh, to learn a little bit more about this very interesting character. These works are a beautiful creation by the German Renaissance artist Lucas Cranach the Elder. And in the first episode, we see people sitting out on, on a field enjoying uh, a banquet open air. And we can immediately identify all of fairness. Olofiernes is the guy who's sitting at the end of the table with a beautiful plum hat, very big hat, and the beautiful lady, very well dressed up as well, beside him is Judith. What happened next is even more interesting. So after this uh, famous banquet... Um, she roofies him? <laughs> he was supposed... Uh, well, he was hoping to get something from her. Oh, he did. Well, <laughs> well, she kind of promised him something, not what directly. <laughs> they were supposed to have sexual intercourse, of course, and he is very happy, goes back to his tent, oh. sends away the guards because she asked so, very clever lady. But then he was so drunk and filled with food that he falls asleep and like she takes his sword and she beheads him. As you should. In the second episode, we see the moment when she's leaving the tent in the middle of the night with the head, the severe head, in the company of her maid. Again, Moschino Resort collection. As we can see from these two images that we just shown, uh, what brings together every single representation of Judith is the emphasis on her beauty, which is the same kind of thing that we saw with David. The difference, very important difference, is that the beauty of David is expressed by his nudity. Mm -hmm. So his beautiful body was often like offered to the viewer in his entire entire aspect. It was anyway. naked, yeah. In the case of Judith, instead her beauty is always related to two details. Her features, her face and the feet. Yeah, and a lot of jewels. 
and a lot of Jews. So we'll go back to that. I, I'm very conflicted when it comes to that because I kind of, I mean, it, at least they were not like objectifying her and using her body to. But on the other side, it's so weird that they just cover her up. I read that um, she was very fully clothed because that was emphasizing how pious she was. Exactly, and... especially in the case of Donatello. Yeah. Let's look at the image together. Okay. So, in the case of Donatello, she's very much overdressed, in my opinion. If you look at this detail, uh, I mean, she has uh, the veil covered in her hair, she's completely fully dressed. And because it has to emphasize the fact that she was a chaste woman, and in the Bible, the, the first description that they give a Judith, they say that she was extremely pious, she was a widow, she was chaste. And actually, she went on mourning for her husband much longer than, than what was required by the Jewish costume. Mm -hmm. So she dressed up in a very sensual way just to conquer and defeat all the fearness, and that's interesting. But she covers herself completely. And in fact, in the passages in the Bible, when the men encounter her and they're smitten by their beauty, they only focus on two things, as I said, the face and the feet. And I want to um, add two quotes for you, which are very telling, in my opinion. Her sandals ravish his eyes, her beauty captivated his mind. But even more interesting is what Judith has to say to the official, the city official, when she goes back to Betulia uh, as a conqueror, as a hero, she kind of like has, has to justify herself because listen what she says to them, to this group of men, because they're a group of men, of course. The Lord has struck him down by the end of a woman. As the Lord lives, who has protected me in that way I went, I swear that it was my face that seduced him to his destruction and that he committed no sin with me to defile and shame me. End quote. So she's specifically saying I didn't do anything with him, uh, it's only my face who conquered him and you know, I was able to do that thanks to the support of God. He never laid a hand on me, never did anything. But it's interesting that she has to say that, mm -hmm. otherwise people would have thought differently. And I think the other thing that we should look at, it's how much effort she puts in dressing up. So <laughs> David has no interest in wearing an armor, okay? In the <laughs> story specifically, they say, yeah, yeah let's that. get rid of the armor. She's putting all those clothes in my opinion. Yeah, oh, so much jewelry that it's almost an armor. Exactly. So he's going That's... to battle and he doesn't wear it. She's going to dinner and she wears it. Like, it's... like she's asked to dress up for success. Like... Which is a man thought. Hello, two things. Number one, I dressed as Donatella Versace one Halloween. I'm gonna pull it out. And I was wearing clip-on earrings. And two hours into wearing them, my earlobes was like as low as my balls. Like number two, she was wearing fifteen pounds of jewelry and forty pounds of clothes of linen. <laughs> like she was probably exhausted by the time she she it's didn't even need to behead him. It was just a natural response to her discomfort. Like in the case of David, with Judith as well, we have several images of Judith that are proliferating, uh, especially in Florence, because again they were considered sort of paired. So I think it's interesting to look at. Uh, the two versions that were created by Botticelli to see how different they are. And I mean, in both images, Judith is represented, of course, as very feminine and, uh, and pretty in general. But the one on the left, which is the earliest example, puts a lot of more emphasis, in my opinion, on the beauty, graceful figure, hair, and her dress, and the beautiful sensual food that is coming out from the long gown that she's wearing. On the other side, the second one, in my opinion, it's very masculine. She looks like she has like there's much less emphasis on the embellishments and she looks more like boyish. All the focus is on her heroic act, not that much on her uh, seductive power. And this has a lot to do with the fact that Sandro Botticelli, toward the end of, of his life, changed a little bit his style because he became a, a devotee of Girolamo Savonarola. What does that mean? So he became like a follower of this crazy friar that in Florence decided to um, persecute any form of vanity. They, he was especially against the kind of art, mythological, neoplatonic, and erotic art that was uh, commissioned and uh, supported by the Medici circle. So he really was preaching against uh, every form of beauty 
that he considered a sign of vanity. And he's the one who actually ordered at some point uh, Il Falò delle Vanità. So he burned oh, thousands of works of art and books and manuscripts and music. So, we mean, talked about it like five days ago, I just remember. Horrible, Sometimes. an horrible story. So Botticelli became a follower. Really. <laughs> and the followers Great. were called Piagnoni because they were uh, flagellants. They were crying and complaining. Anyway, so you can definitely see a change of style. You can see that he's not anymore the happy artist that he was before. All focused on the beauty and... Is this the pregnant with grace situation? Exactly. Well, that's a, how I explain. I never found an explanation for that. Okay. But it seems very strange to me that she really looks pregnant, but we know she's a widow. So Yeah. The only explanation that I have is that she's like that because she's pregnant with the grace of God. And I know that for the fact that it's often referred to the Virgin Mary. Okay. And they use that expression for the Virgin Mary? Well, for example, uh, yeah, there is a painting, maybe we should put up the painting too. Mm -hmm. um, the one that we saw together in class, I'm sure you remember, Caravaggio, the death of the Virgin, where she's laying on, on the, like a piece of table, it's not even a bed, and she's dressing red, and she I seems like that. pregnant. And um, people were complaining, were horrified when they saw the painting, because they, they, there was a rumor at that time that Caravaggio used as a model a prostitute that had drawn in the river, uh -huh. and because Wait, she a had, prostitute that, he, that, that was pregnant and that drawn in the river. Oh, that drawn in the river. Okay. So, but in reality, uh, some scholars have, have emphasized the fact that the Virgin Mary is often referred as uh, pregnant with grace, and that reference the soul, this the swollen womb could be uh, related to death. <laughs> The Harry, oh yes, Judith is often compared to the Virgin Mary. It's something we don't say in this talk, but throughout the Middle Ages, sometimes so she is represented as a sort of like, um, like allegory of chastity and just a symbol of the Virgin Mary, like a sort of like the perfect model of how to be a good woman, according to Christian beliefs. No sex, basically. Maybe we should explain what it means. Was Chaste means that you no. are oh. pure and you don't use sex as a pleasure. And even if you're a married woman, by the way, I was listening to an interesting talk last night of an historian, and she said that women were supposed to be chaste even within their marriage in the sense that men, um, you know, always wanted sex with their wives. So the wives have to always to say no first, you know, just to start with, and play hard to get. And then eventually satisfy them every once in a while. <laughs> well, but that hasn't changed very much. <laughs> okay, let's look at another painting by Giorgio Vasari. Most of you awesome. might have heard Giorgio Vasari in connection to the first book uh, about the history of artists, basically. He was mostly renowned to be like a, an art critic. And no matter how biased it was, his uh, book is still a very important testimony and a very important source of information about all the artists uh, from the Renaissance until his period. Giorgio Vasari was also a painter, not a great painter. That's the reason why maybe he gave up painting and started writing. Shady. Now we look at this painting by Vasari and we immediately sense that there is a, a like, in my opinion, a very a very strong sense of ambiguity between uh, the female beauty of Judith and her like male strength. I don't know if you notice what I noticed, Frida, but I think that yeah, she, she looks like Harry Styles, which I don't think do you know the no. whole deal about Harry Styles. Um, yeah, that's Harry Styles. That's a woman's gown uh, and a male body. I mean, look at those arms. The yeah, arms, that's male. That's male anatomy. The exactly, but, but the yeah. shoulders. The torso. Uh, and I'm sure, like, you mean that's this ambiguity. Do, do, yeah, because they knew how to paint women, so I guess. Of course. It does on purpose. It makes her look ambiguous because he wants to show that despite being a, a beautiful lady, and look, all the emphasis uh, on her beauty, it's in the face features. Mm -hmm. Again. So that's where she's braiding. She has a beautiful hair, which is braided, like, in this kind of, like, uh, ancient style that you will see in ancient sculptures. But then she's also wearing this uh, piece of armor, which is called a cuirass. And those were actually a sign of status. They were worn only by Roman generals. So she's dressed like a soldier. But then, you know, the piece of armor is lower, so we can see a little bit of her skin. But again, there's nothing really feminine about 
this Judith, except from she's wearing the skirt mm -hmm. and that's it. And if we compare the work of Giorgio Vasari with uh, the representation of Judith, but especially with the representation of um, uh, the Libyan Sibyl by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel ceiling, we see where that was coming from. So Giorgio Vasari was obsessed, had a little crush on Michelangelo in my opinion. Um, he was obsessed with Michelangelo, he was considered one of the greatest artists. And Giorgio Vasari always preferred Florentine artists to any other artist because he was from Florence. Let's look at this one. What do you think about this one? Van Hemsen. So this is a Flemish Renaissance artist uh, uh, that uh, also was a very, very much inspired by Michelangelo. And again, his Judith is quite interesting. That's a male butt. That's the main difference. Men have like squarish butts and women have more like... So that's a male or a female, sorry? You know, male butt. Male. Wasn't it in your class that you were drawing comparison between how f female painters and male painters and breasts? And man is like, boobies up, blah, blah, blah. And we were <laughs> like, no, that's not exactly what it's like. Well, they're a little bit more soft and they go down <laughs> sometimes. And they're not yeah, so that's... symmetric and perfectly round. No, and... one is always bigger. If, if there's something that I know by having a lot of girlfriends is, one is always way bigger in their words than the other one. It's not, you cannot see that. But we, all my girlfriends are like, look at this. I mean, they didn't. <laughs> They don't show it to me, but... This girl is disturbing to me. Uh, apart from the face, uh, the rest of the body is very much a male. And it's also the first instance that I could find out of a Judith completely naked. Okay. So this is the opposite than uh, uh, Donatello's. Uh, and it's quite interesting because there is a, a second line of interpretation of Judith that will, was developed later on, so it's outside our time frame. But later on, especially in the... 18th century and and later, Judith is always represented as a femme fatale, like a castrating woman with this very powerful sexuality. So I think this is the beginning of that. The only uh, prototype of heroism is, is men. men. Yeah. So she has to be shaped like a man because otherwise... And I agree with that, but then with David they did the opposite. It's almost as if they... If, if it's a woman to give her strength, she has to be a man. If you're a man and you need charisma, you need to be a woman. Not a woman, but borrow traits. Well, that's true, but uh, we. I also have to confess that I chose a specific representation of David where there was the homoerotic component. Oh, right. So it depends from the representation, and sometimes he was chosen for the reason that I was trying to explain last time, because yeah. he was uh, interesting for a male viewer with certain kind of like... Uh, Orientation, let's say, or oh, 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 they like Gay. it. I think that that has a lot to do with who perpetrated this was Michelangelo then, mm. you know, because he made those, that beautiful naked uh, David that is still like a symbol of David. Yeah, so that's, yeah. Artists was in, were influenced after that. Every single virtue or characteristic of uh, Judith in her story, it's a male, male ideal. The only feminine things that they say about Judith is that, that she's very beautiful. She is a true leader, is a male thing. Because she be she behaves like a true man. She goes to the city official and says, what are you doing, guys? Why you are you want to you know, try to fight back the enemy? You are mistrusting God. I will take the situation into my own hands. She doesn't ask for help. She does everything on her own. So she's extremely brave, which is another male characteristic. She is also verbose. She talks a lot, way too much for a woman, because women were supposed to shut up. In the Bible, she is the one who has more lines than any other character. And she's very wise. Another thing that it's usually uh, a component of male, of a male character. She's, women are never really described as super wise, quite the opposite. And she's able to achieve everything that she does using, as we said, no weapon except from her faith in God, her beauty, and her courage, basically. So she's an extraordinary woman. This transgression of gender in her figure, in her representation, becomes even more evident in the Baroque period when this contrast between her female beauty and her male strength sometimes take, uh, sometimes is very much revealed in the way that she's represented body-wise, as we saw before, but also sometimes now we see the sexually threatening aspect that comes up, you know, because there is the element of violence that it's now emphasized in Baroque paintings. 
before we never really see her in the act of killing all of Pyrrhus, but now we see some blood coming out. So now we, we uh, we're finally seeing uh, Frida's favorite painting. Painter. Uh, Ah, painter, sorry, painter. not painting. Anyway, so um, I think that the best way to introduce Artemisia is that Artemisia, well, look at this painting, guys, and listen to my words. Artemisia, people rumor, painted like a man, or even better than a man. You can immediately see that, what I mean, because if you saw some of the beheading scenes of Caravaggio, and you think Caravaggio is brutal, you never seen Artemisia Gentileschi. <laughs> There's no one drip of blood to stain our skin. Notice that. I mean, if you try to kill somebody like that, I'm, Don't sure, try <laughs> I'm sure you will get a little dirty, but she has no stains. Pure which beginning. means that her killing, in my opinion, is justified by God. Huh? Oh, because God said, you can do it, Judith, with my blessing. Mm -hmm. So she can actually be had a human being and not having the stain of sin mm, in her like skin, in her beautiful skin. So art historians have tried to understand why she represents Judith this way and why she was kind of obsessed with the figure of Judith because she made several paintings, several versions of the same story, different moments of the story, not always the killing moment. And they have been trying to explain that by saying that she had a special connection with this female hero, not only because she was a female or Safa, because of her personal experience, mm -hmm. that she wanted to overcome a male-dominated world because of what happened to her in her personal life. And I'm sure you remember what yeah. happened to her. What happened to her? Well, she got raped when she was 17 years old by a friend, a family friend, a friend of her father. Mm -hmm. And then he was trial for that, but not because he raped her, but because he, then he wouldn't marry her after exactly. raping her. And of course he was charged. I mean, he was charged, but then of course he, he didn't have to do anything. Exactly. Nothing happened to him. She was trial, it was a very humiliating trial for her. She was being tor tortured during the trial, I remember. Her father gave her in the hands of this awful person, because mm -hmm. this awful person was renowned to be a rapist and a murderer. Yeah, he was going around and bragging about the fact that he defloorated uh, his uh, sister-in-law and he was uh, accused of killing somebody if I remember correctly but anyway he had um, a criminal record. Rape was something that was uh, until recent and unfortunately in some countries still happens it's something quite common for women. In the Renaissance the most outrageous part is that when you were raped you, do, you didn't have time to complain or um, mourn about your your sufferance, because the most important thing that you lost was your virginity. They ruined your reputation, so you were not a marriable person anymore. You could not get married, and that was the most important things at that time. So the story is that the father denounced Agostino Tassi for what he did to his daughter just because he refused to marry her after he defloated her. So after he ruined her, basically, and she was not more easy to sell to another man, the father pursued him, and that's the only reason why. Not because she was uh, a victim of an act of violence. Who cares about that? <laughs> you know, the fact is that she was not easy to marry anymore. And so the story is that he went to trial and he tried to fix that. What happened is that nothing got fixed and she was forced in the end to marry. The only other person who would agree to marry somebody who was not a virgin anymore. So that's the story of poor Artemisia. But the detail that is most interesting about the records of the trial is that uh, Artemisia says specifically that her, she was in the room with him with a female chaperone. So the father uh, knew that it was not appropriate to leave her with a man alone. So she was always with a third person. But that this lady sold herself, basically. He paid her to be left alone with her. So this woman, who was a woman and knew what was going to happen, did not help her. So she felt betrayed, she said, in the, in the trial. And I think that's one of the reasons why this has been suggested by other people, not by me, that uh, here the maid of Judith is very much physically helping her because that's what she was hoping to get from another fellow woman. Maybe the message that Judith is given in this painting is that if women really collaborated with one another, they would actually be able to overcome this male-dominated world. The problem is that many women actually support the patriarchal society still to this day. That's why. Hi guys, Frida here. Um, we're putting this episode together. Um, we had a lot of material um, to go through 
And we have decided uh, post filming to actually split this episode into part one and two. So we're going to interrupt right here while we're telling the story. Uh, the story. Uh, <laughs> uh, goodbye. The story of uh, of Artemisia, and we're gonna resume with the second part of this episode that we decided to call "Will a Sever Had Do." Um, yep. So thank you so much, guys. Am I gonna leave the? Maybe you know what, guys? I'm gonna leave the outro that we recorded originally. So um see you soon <laughs> so thank you so much guys for being with us uh we're gonna post content every week so feel free to subscribe and hit the like button and our next chapter is going to be about women in power exactly since we'll be talking about artemisa Gentileschi, i think that we should give a little bit more space to exceptional women Absolutely. because there were a number of them so so thank you for being with us and we'll see you next time